Hi, and welcome to EduSlam, where we take a few minutes to interview some of the world's most innovative educators. My name is Tanya Averth, and I'm from Montreal, Canada. Hi, I'm Holly from San Diego. And Tom, why don't you tell us about your EduSlam? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me. Appreciate it, Tanya. Appreciate Holly. Hey, Tanya, how are things in Montreal, fellow Canadian? Uh, <laughs> I hope things are good. Um, Holly, I know you just got back from a big trip to South Korea. Very exciting. And I hope the jet, jet lag's not too bad. Um, the Edge of Slam today will be based on an article I wrote uh, called Five Critical Mistakes Schools Make with iPads and How to Correct Them. And I'm going to focus on number one, and that is um, undue focus on content apps. So this is probably the most prevalent issue that we see in schools, that educators are choosing apps primarily based on teaching content. Um, it's very discipline specific, very grade level specific, and unfortunately it can blind them to really the, the full comprehensive power of what students can actually do with an iPad. So that's really what I'll focus on today. So take it away. All right, great. So what I'll do is maybe do a little screen share here, and I'll just bring up a, a few slides and kind of some visuals and kind of guide us along the way. Um, so I'll just take a second, and then uh, hopefully it's starting. And then you should see uh, a little slide in front of you, five critical mistakes schools make with iPads. Hey, Tanya uh, or Holly, just let me know that you can see that so the audience can. You're can good. See. Great. All right, so um, I wrote this uh, about a year ago. And it was in a reaction to going around and as, as director of EdTech teacher um, and instructor and presenter going around to various schools across the country and sometimes abroad and getting a sense of how teachers are integrating iPads. And what I find over and over is that there were, um, you know, many, many middle schools and high schools where the teachers were going through lists and lists and lists and lists of apps, like, you know, 50 geography apps, 100 physics apps, and spending an inordinate amount of time looking at apps to teach content. And many of these apps um, are largely drill and kill, not terribly intuitive. And there's, of course, a different reading level, and it was tough to create a very co cohesive um, unit or program out of these disparate apps. And, you know, as having teachers telling me that the iPad was useless because, um, as one Latin teacher said, well, I can't find a good Latin app. And, you know, it just really didn't occur to him and doesn't occur to many teachers that they don't even need a single subject app to be able to teach effectively with iPads. I mean, like I told the Latin teacher and, I, and I've told other teachers is, look, if if, if you want to improve kids' communication skills, uh, to improve their collaboration skills, to improve their presentation skills, to provide them all sorts of opportunities for them to present their knowledge and understanding, mastery of a topic, you only need a handful of apps. I mean, basically all the apps you need can fit on one screen. And so, you know, an example of, uh, of that would be just a screencasting app. So you take something like Explain Everything. I mean, you've got a blank screen, and so you can, you can type, you can write, you can draw, you can add images, you can add video, you can, add, you can create animations, you can create special effects. You can do just about anything with one app. So the question becomes, I mean, what can students do? What can students create? So this uh, image here is kind of an iPad, as you see, sort of on top of the school. And one of the things that we try to figure out is whether um, schools are really just trying to place the iPad on top of an existing instructional model, which might be ill-suited, might be a little bit outdated to iPad integration. I mean, think about this, right? I mean, you've got an iPad. You've got something that's kinesthetic. That's something that's mobile. That's something that can personalize, differentiate instruction. And yet what we're finding is a lot of um, teachers kind of take the iPad and they try to want to make it look, kind of act like a computer or just sort of do what they were doing before and, and hope the iPad fits. So the iPad's not meant really to take notes. You think about it, right? I mean, it's not, I mean, it doesn't have a keyboard. It's not really meant to, meant to take notes. And yet, you know, we're, 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 we're saying, okay, well, you know, it's not taking notes as well as my um, laptop, so somehow it's not that good. Or, you know, it's the kind of thing where kids are, you know, sitting in rows and the teacher's up top, uh, teacher's at, at, you know, at top and kind of, you know, d dissemination of, of, of information to a passive audience maybe. Whereas, you know, if you've got something that's really mobile and kids can move around, they can move in groups, you can redesign, reconfigure, re-architecture that classroom in any way because you've got 
something that's portable. It's mobile, so you can take it out in the yard. You can take it on a field trip. You can take it anywhere. You can take pictures with it. You can shoot video with it. So, you know, the teachers who really have it inside the classroom and not on top of an existing structure, they kind of focus on what the iPad does well. So one of the coolest things is the kinesthetic value. Right? So you can actually be immersed into molecules using your fingers. So you can zoom in, zoom out, you can rotate it and do all these things. I mean, that's pretty neat. I remember when, you know, teachers would try to bring in like these wooden molecules because they were trying to simulate a 3D experience. Well, I mean, you've got that. So why not think about how the kinesthetic elements of the iCAD could be built into more effective instruction, play to its strengths. You've got a camera, so you can take pictures of all sorts of things. Kids can take screenshots. That's great for formative assessment. At any point in time, kids can take a picture of what they're working on. So you can check what they're working on. They can email it to you. You can walk over. Kids can take pictures of your notes. You can take videos of kids who of exemplary behaviors. I mean, kids are doing a great work. Kids are, are collaborating really well. You know, so we're asking, you know, we're asking to go to schools, like, how are you using the tablets, right, whether it be iPads or whatever it is. And we're getting things like, okay, it's, um, it's kind of a repository of apps. I mean, it's kind of like, okay, you know, we, we've got a lot of apps on it. We use it for apps. We teach content with apps. Oh, it's an e-reader. We, we put the textbooks. Oh, it's great because they don't have to lug the textbooks. Well, that's convenience, right? But that's not to the heart of teaching and learning. It's really a convenience. Um, so, you know, they're telling us it's, it's a convenience. They're trying to make it something that it isn't as a note-taking device. They're focusing on teaching content with apps in, instead of thinking about maybe non-subject apps, what I call evergreen apps, that is, apps that could be used anytime, anywhere, um, and could have kids represent what they know, such as a screencasting app. So if, if you've got a screencasting app, you've got an iMovie app, for example, you know, a video app, then you can shoot video, you can edit video, you've got a camera app, you've got some things, um, you know, you could throw in something like Animoto for a, a presentation app, a subtext so you could collaboratively read together and take notes together. I mean, with a handful of apps, throwing Google Drive for a lot of, a lot of collaboration sharing. Um, you know, you can sprinkle in a few subject apps, but really, handful is all you need. So we should be really aiming, hopefully, for ENF. There's not a lot of what we find. Uh, we, find we don't find a lot of um, teachers doing something like this. And this, you know, if you want to take a look at this uh, video, we can't show it through the Google Hangout. But go here, um, Science Explain, uh, Lisa Johnson out, out of Texas. This is terrific. These are kids, you know, middle schoolers explaining plate tectonics. And, and they're just using one app, right, one app. And I don't know if it's explained everything, but it's, it's a screencasting app. One app. And you have some kids, you know, they're typing. Some kids, they are writing. Some kids are speaking. Some kids are showing the plate to tonics by having the plates in animation, like, moving apart. Um, and, and others are using, a, like, images and call-outs. So they're representing, like, showing what they know and understand in all these different ways, but they're just using one app. And that app's not designed for a particular subject. It's not like it's a science app. Um, you know, it's not, you know, it's not a math app, but it's an app where you can do, kids can create just about anything, anywhere, anytime. So, hey, what could they create? These kids create really cool tutorials about science. And then this is one, it's one of my favorites. Um, this is a school out of... Indianapolis, and you know what they do is the kids go outside, right? And they're taking pictures of butterflies. It's a whole, you know, it's a whole presentation really on butterflies. Kindergarten kids going out in the yard. Hey, it's mobile. Teachers taking advantage of that. They're 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 moving outside and inside the class. They're like moving around. There's all these different configurations with uh, the iPad, which is really really neat. And they're researching. And we sometimes forget. I mean, we're looking at the app, the apps, right? But we've got like the world's information on the web. We've got all this information. So think about how could we use it for research? How could we bring in that bring in that information? So she's doing that with the kids. And the kids create this real cool video along with the teacher explaining butterflies. And it's really cool. So you know it brings in the mobility. It brings in uh, the um, you know, the, the, the creativity of the kids creating, along with the teacher, because they're young, uh, the kids creating a presentation uh, about this. You look at the video, too, and, um, you know, there's all sorts of different learning environments. There's a little bit of stand-up and uh, deliver, and but there's also kids uh, interacting, immersed, inside, outside, story time, on the video, whatever it is. 
And that's like taking advantage of this mobility, all the different possibilities that you have. And the teacher plays different roles, sometimes front and center, sometimes like in this picture, um, you know, sitting beside the kids and kind of working with the kids. So one of the you know key things we try to get across to everybody is that you know let's you've got a portable media creation device if you've got iMovie and explain everything and let's say GarageBand and you've got some you know cool presentation apps like I mentioned before maybe something like like an Animoto some people like um, Nearpod. Uh, for instance, um, you know, and then you've got something where you could collaborate effectively, like subtext around a web page, around a PDF, around a book. You've got something like Google Drive, where you can do collaborative work together and editing and share. I mean, like you could do just about anything. So why not focus on the benefits? the intrinsic benefits of an iPad, its mobility, its that kinesthetic value, um, the, the, the fact that we can redesign the classroom, reconfigure classroom, create all these different learning environments. We can personalize it. Kids can work at their own level. We have accessibility features that will help them with consumption of text and uh, you know, basically consumption of all sorts of different materials. Take advantage of those, personalize it, and we can differentiate. We can meet kids at different levels too. Whether they're just starting out, they're, they're more advanced, uh, or they're somewhere in the middle. So think about what an iPad can do and build on that. Don't concentrate in getting caught up in the iPad versus the you know, computer or the iPad versus this, iPad or that. If you really want it to be inside and not on top, you're going you're gonna to focus on what the iPad does well and you're going to then play to its strengths and hopefully develop these creative learning environments where kids get to show you all the great things that they know. Okay. That's fantastic, and it's really words for people to live by because um, way too many um, schools get iPads and they just fill them up with tons of apps. And 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 to be honest, when you just I, I know from experience when teachers are starting out, that's the 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 the, the last thing that you should be doing. Um, you know, so I hope that you know people will watch this Edu Slam, show it at a staff meeting, and uh, you know when they're introducing iPads to their staff, you know, to give them good ideas of things that they can do. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, my background is as a history teacher. I taught history for 15 years, a little bit in Europe after college, back in, hey, Montreal, Tanya, uh, my, old high school, my old high school in Montreal. I've been in Boston for over 15 years now. I taught, um, taught an independent school here outside of Boston. Um, but uh, I've been running um, uh, EdTech Teacher along with Justin Wright, my co-director. Some of you may know him as an Ed Week blogger. Um, and so Justin and I have been uh, managing um, EdTech Teacher. And, you know, we work with schools and districts. Uh, and we help them, hopefully, with uh, effective uses of technology. And there's a lot of interest in iPads. And I, you know, as you both know, we have the iPad Summit uh, that we ran in Boston last year. We ran it in, uh, in April in Atlanta. We have it coming back to Boston in November. And we're going to San Diego, so near you, Holly. Uh, we're going to be in San Diego in uh, February, February 3rd to 5th. So um, excited about that and excited that you both will be, will be part of it. Well, we're very happy to to have you on, and as you we've told you in the past, um, iPad Summit for Holly and I is very special because that's where we first met last year. That's right. Um, so we're we're definitely excited to to be both there for the San Diego one, and I know Holly will be at the Boston one, so she's really looking forward to. It. So thank you so much for coming on today, and I'm sure people watching are going to be very excited to either be present at the iPad Summit or be tweeting along with you. Um, um, during uh, the days. Can you say the days again? Yeah, well, the one in Boston is November 13th to 15th. You can get information at edtechteacher.org. And uh, the one in San Diego is February 3rd to 5th. We have a pre-conference, which is one-day workshops, and then we have two-day of conference. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Tom. Right, we hope to have Thanks, you on again. Thanks, Thank Holly. You. Thank you very much.